Lift. Lift your mood is what we're going to talk about this morning. But we started last week in a series that we're engaging in. You can go back to the other one, please. On lift. What is lift? Lift is to move someone or something to a higher position. To raise up from the ground or the, some other surface. Or to move someone or something to a higher <laughs> condition. What we want to talk about over these next couple of weeks, and we kind of mentioned how airplanes lift off, people will take lifts to up mountains to ski, people, get kids, people lift their kids up in the air. But what we want to talk about is how God brings a lift into our life. How many of you believe that God doesn't want to leave you on the low ground? Amen. In fact, we used to sing hymns like he um, pulled me out of the miry clay, he set my feet on the rock to say, um, you know, how Jesus lifted us up, lift Jesus higher and... God wants to bring lift into our life. He doesn't want to leave you in the low places. He wants to elevate you to greater places. We opened with a scripture last week, and we'll be repeating the scripture every week. James 4.10 says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. True lift can only happen in our lives when we lower ourselves, and raise God up. And that's the most important thing, because in this world, we fight so hard to lift ourselves up. We fight to elevate ourselves in pride, and position, and family, and jobs. <clears throat> we try to lift our own selves up in our mood, and in, in, in our financial well-being, and other things. But true lift will only come, lift that will last, will only come when we humble ourselves before God, and allow Him to lift us up to the places He wants to lift us up. That happens when we submit ourselves to this Word. And true lift happens in our lives. A lot of people go, we look at the Bible, and people look and say, well, that's such an ancient book. Why should I really follow that? When you look at the words of this book, these words have life. They have meaning. They have truth. And when we realize that the words that are in this book, even though they seem so contrary to our culture, so contrary to our society, to what everybody else does, when we say, you know what, I'm not going to trust my own thoughts, my own ways, or society's way of doing things. I'm going to trust what God's Word tells me. When we do that, and we humble ourselves before this Word, and we surrender our choices and our decisions and the way we live to the Bible, then that brings the true lift in our life. That's when God is able then to take and lift us up to higher places. So this morning I want to talk about lifting our mood. Lift our mood. Any of you ever need your mood lifted? Yeah. Come on, there's nobody in this room that's ever not needed their mood lifted. Sometimes in life we get depressed. Now for some, depression is very minimal. For some people, you know, they just get down or discouraged a little. For some people, depression is great. It's a very deep and dark place. For some, we get anxious. We're always fearing what's ahead. We're worrying about tomorrow. We're worrying about the bills. We're worrying about the next thing. Others that get angry. And we struggle with anger or feelings of maybe we've been hurt and there might be bitterness in our hearts, but we feel frustration and anger towards others. Sometimes we're just stressed. Whatever the mood is that's driving us or the mood is that's controlling us, God wants to bring lift to our mood. That doesn't mean that we're always going to walk around being the most happy-go-lucky people on the earth with ever a care in the world. But God understands that these moods are very real, these circumstances and feelings that we experience are very real, but there are ways that if we apply God's word, that he can lift us from those places and put us into new realms of positive moods. Let's talk about three of them this morning. The first I want to talk about is that God wants to take your mood from heaviness to praise. From heaviness to praise. Anybody ever feel the heaviness of depression? The heaviness of the weights of concern? Isaiah 61.3 says, To console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that He may be glorified. Heaviness is a depression that comes over people that it's with that depression and that that darkness that really leaves that heavy feeling in your chest. It's exactly what it means. That when you feel that heaviness or that weight upon you, it robs joy. It brings fear. The word, the Hebrew word for kehet, which is in this in this passage, actually means to be in a dark place, a dark like place, 
where it's faint to feel the dimness of light when things seem colorless. Too many people understand what it is to be in that kind of depression and that kind of heaviness. You know, as our society um, goes on, there's so much because we have so much access to information, so much access to news, so much commentator on all the things that are going on in our world. It can be a very discouraging place. And the generations even growing up, they feel almost greater discouragement, greater weight, greater hopelessness than generations that have come before them. And in that heaviness, in that dark place, we can feel robbed of hope. We can feel robbed of joy, and it feels sometimes like a weight that can sink us down and leave us in the pit forever. The Bible, actually, Isaiah, uses the term spirit of heaviness. And that really indicates something, that that heaviness is not just something we feel, but there are actual demonic entities that come behind that. There are actual spiritual principalities that work against people, and even many Christians, to bring them to that place of feeling that heaviness, that despair, that hopelessness. You know, as a church, we raise the coin, hope is here. We believe in hope. It's on our stage, right? We believe in hope. But hope comes, when that heaviness comes, the way that we get lifted up out of that heaviness, God has made a way, and that's by putting on the garment of praise. Like, well, Pastor, what do you mean? Garment of praise. It's exactly what it sounds like. The garment of praise, the word garment in this passage of Scripture, is what... um, is what in the day of the prophet Isaiah, it's what a king would put on after mourning. When a king might have been in mourning, he would actually come out afterwards, and when it was time to go back into a time of celebration in life, he had a robe that would, that would actually acknowledge to everybody, it's time to celebrate. It's time to be in celebration. And you know, the Bible tells us that he gives us beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning. There are seasons in our lives where we do mourn over things. There are seasons in our lives where we do feel the depths of despair. But God doesn't want us to leave us there. But when we put on the garment of praise, and it's that literal, put on. You can't get the garment of praise by just expecting it to happen. You know, it's kind of like going to church, and you go to church, and you know, the music starts up, and you just sit there. You know, praise is a choice. You choose to clap your hands. That's why you don't just clap your hands. You don't clap your hands. Declares, it declares victory. Glory. Raising your hands declares surrender. When we raise our hands, it's because we're surrendering to God. When we're clapping, we're declaring victory. There's reasons behind the different postures that we take when we praise. But praise is a choice. You know, it's never intended in our church to be a concert. We want it to be participatory. We want everybody to engage and praise. Because when we put on praise, it's kind of like putting on your pants in the morning. You have to put them on, and a lot of you are wearing pants, a lot of you are wearing pants this morning, you put them on, but later the time, you have to choose to put that garment on. And sometimes we can come to church, we can be discouraged, we can be down, we've had a rough week, you know, no one knows the week that I've had, my week has been so bad, but you have to choose to put on the garment of praise. But not only in church. Sometimes you're at home, and you're feeling that heaviness coming upon you. Your mood is being brought down. Maybe something bad happened at work. Maybe some form of discouragement took place. Maybe something in your family is going on. You don't have to wait to get to church to praise. Yeah. Put on a, a Christian CD. Put on a praise CD or something. Put on, find a Christian radio station and begin to praise the Lord. Put on the garment of praise. Say, you know what? Devil, I am a child of the king. I'm going to put on my kingly garment. I'm going to put on my royal robes. I'm going to begin praising God because when I praise God, I remember all the things He's done in the past. When I praise Him because He's mighty, it lets me know He's not too small for my problem. When I praise Him because He's omniscient, it reminds me that He knows what I'm going through. You know, when we begin to praise God for who He is, when I praise Him because He's sovereign, it means that I understand that if I'm going through this situation at this time, there's a purpose in it and a meaning that God's going to derive out of it. Even though I don't understand it right now, somehow He's going to work something out. And when we begin to praise, what we do is we give the devil notice. It actually, the Bible tells us, when we praise the Lord, he flees from us. The heaviness has to go. Because all of a sudden we bring hope into our lives because we're giving our surrender. We're remembering, hey, we're children of the king. We don't belong to that heaviness. We don't belong to the devil. And you might say, well, that kind of seems so simple. You know what it is? It actually is. Put on the garment of heaviness, or the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. You know, Jesus, in the verses before this, it speaks of two verses that Jesus proclaimed regarding himself and his own ministry. 
Isaiah 61, 1 to 2 says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Okay, if you're brokenhearted, Jesus came to heal you. If you're feeling poor, Jesus came to, to, to help you. To proclaim liberty to the captives. If you're feeling bound by something, bound by a sin, bound by an addiction, bound by a mood, bound by a feeling, He came to set you free. And the opening of the prison to those who are bound. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That's the year of jubilee. That's the year of rejoicing. The year of jubilee was the year that people were set free from their debts. They were set free from their slavery. And the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. This is why Christ came. And when we put on the garment of praise, we're reminding ourselves, I am a joint heir with Jesus. I am a child of of the king. Yes. I am a part of the yes. family of God, and the enemy does not have the last word. Heaviness and despair does not have the last word. Nothing can separate me from the love of Christ. I belong to God, He belongs to me. And as we praise Him, heaviness has to go. So if you want to lift your mood, learn how to praise. You want to lift that heaviness, learn to praise. And realize, realize that as you praise, hope will come into your heart. And don't become discouraged when you're going through. Some of you say, well, but my, my problems are going to be all around me. That's not going to make my problems go away. Maybe not. But it's going to help you gain strength in the midst of your problems. Right. And when you come out of that problem, you're going to be able to fly high. Right. Let me talk to you for a moment about the emperor moth. Can we get a picture of that caterpillar up real quick? <laughs> this is an emperor moth caterpillar. He's actually kind of a cute caterpillar. Fuzzy little thing that he is. You know, I remember my, not, my remembrance of caterpillars as a child was stepping on them and seeing how far you can make their guts squish out. <laughs> oh, come on, did you all do that? Every guy in the room's going, oh yeah. And I remember every woman's going, oh, that's so okay. weird, they're so fuzzy and cute. <laughs> the emperor moth is probably in the moth realm. I know we were thinking butterflies. It's probably one of the more beautiful moths that are out there. But it starts off like, like this. Kind of crawling on its belly, crawling on its ground. But it has greater heights in, 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 in store for it. It has a greater destiny than just to walk along the, the, the dredges of the earth. It is intended to fly high. It's intended to fly, to soar, to actually become a beautiful being. But before it can do that, it's got to put itself in a cocoon. Can you get that one up? Here is an emperor moth cocoon. Now, I want you to notice something about this cocoon. Do you see how small the top of it is compared to the base of it? That's the moth down in the bottom. He's kind of big. That opening is not too large, is it? In order for it to come out, it will have to break through that opening. Now, there was a scientist once that decided that he was going to do an experiment. And he, he was watching these, these emperor moths try to break through the cocoons. And he was, he was worried about them because they were struggling so much to break out of that hole. That bottleneck top. And so he decided to take a little scissors and he clipped the edges so that way the caterpillar could be, or the, well, now the moth, could be set free. And the moth came out, but the problem was when it came out, it flopped onto the table and hobbled around on the table for a few moments and then it died. And he realized that by removing it from its suffering, by removing it from its struggle, he actually had weakened it and kept it from reaching its fullest of potentials. But when left to struggle and to fight through that small opening, can we get the next picture? The emperor moth came out, comes out, is strong. You see, what happens when they're coming out through that little small opening is that pressure that comes upon them puts pressure on their wings and it forces all the fluid that they need into their wings to come in to bring the strength in their wings that they can fly. You know, in our lives, sometimes we might have to go through hard circumstances, we might have to go through difficulties, but it's kind of like that breaking through. When we come through those struggles, those pressures, on the other side, there's greatness. On the other side, there's blessing. On the other side, there's the ability to fly and to fly above those things. Because Paul says in Romans 8, 18, he says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Out of our suffering, God wants to bring beauty. Out of the ashes of our life, God wants to bring greatness. And the pressures of our life might be there, but God wants to bring greatness out of them. So when you're in the heaviness, don't realize that maybe you might still have to walk through the struggle, 
But God has given you the key, the garment of praise to remind you of who you are and to remind you that, you know, the hardest thing is when you're first going through any type of struggle or when you first become a Christian and you begin walking through difficulties, you think this doesn't happen to anybody else. This is going to destroy me. It's going to be the end of my life. You have hopelessness. But in reality, when you come out, you're going to come out also. When you come through it to the other side, it's going to be a good thing. So begin to praise the Lord in the middle of that. Send the heaviness running and realize that when you come out on the other side, you're going to be more beautiful than what you were before you went into the cocoon. Amen? Praise Amen. God. Amen? Amen. All right. A couple of you are listening out there. All right. Next, let's talk about going from anger to forgiveness. No one in this room's ever gotten angry, have you? Nah, nobody's ever gotten mad. Anger, it's a real emotion. The problem is God doesn't want us to live in an angry mood. Have you ever met people who live in angry moods? Cranky, they're honoring, blame. It's a real feeling to feel anger. Anger is an emotion. It comes from disappointment. It comes from being hurt. It comes from being let down. It's real. God himself has experienced anger. The Bible talks about God experiencing anger. Jesus experienced anger when he walked in the temple and saw that they had transformed the temple into a, into a place of den, a den of thieves and selling things and taking advantage of people rather than a place of prayer. But anger can quickly give way to sin if it's not dealt with properly. Ephesians 4, 26-27 says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. So feeling anger is not a sin. You can feel anger. But you got to pull the anger under submission to what God's word says. You have to pull the anger into a place of control that it doesn't take control over you. Murder happens because people become angry to a point that they can really control nothing. People go out and they commit crimes in anger. People go out and harm other people or hurt one another because of anger. And a lot of times anger, when it rises up, it's going to give way to bitterness if it's not dealt with. Unchecked anger becomes bitterness. It grows deep roots into our hearts, and thus it affects our mood and our demeanor. You can tell people, there are people who are sometimes are walking out in depression, and it's really because they have, they have unforgiveness in their heart, and there's anger that's festering underneath them because they're dealing with pain. A lot of times it's pain that's not been dealt with. But the antidote to dealing with that pain is forgiveness. How do we lift the mood of anger? How do we get rid of the bitterness? It's by forgiving. You've heard it said before, you'll hear it again, because the entire theme of this book is forgiveness. The entire theme of this book is how, you know, if anyone had ever transgressed anybody, it's we, how we have transgressed God. Our lives are making our own choices, doing our own things. We have sinned against God, and yet God chooses to still forgive us. But he also tells us that even as we've been forgiven, we have to forgive others. It's the antidote to being angry. Forgiveness is often a process. It's not just something you're going to say with your mouth, but something you have to do with your heart. And it's often something that's going to keep on coming back to you. The deeper you've been wounded, the deeper you've been hurt, the longer it's going to take and the more you're going to have to choose to forgive when the feelings of anger come up again. Because sometimes anger will resurface and then you have to deal with it all over again. You have to surrender to God all over again. You have to give it back over to Him when you feel wrong. But if we don't, we'll begin to villainize people, We'll begin to, our perception of people and things will become distorted. We won't be able to see clearly. And in the end, bitterness will destroy the person who is unforgiving. Anger will take control and will consume every part of their life. Matthew 6, verses 12 to 15 says this. <coughs> it says, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. You know, you could put that right along with that previous verse. Don't lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. If we'll forgive others who have done us wrong, as we want to be forgiven, we must forgive others. And by forgiving, it actually removes us from places of greater temptation. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Now, look at verse 15. But if you don't forgive men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. Okay, let me ask you. How many of you like it when somebody holds something against you? 
Nobody likes it when someone holds something against us. We don't like it. It puts us in their prison, the debtor's prison. But what happens is when we choose to not forgive other people, we build the debtor's prison around ourselves because all of a sudden everything we've done wrong to other people, it's being held against us because we don't feel the forgiveness of God. And then we have to hold things against other people to try and pay that debt. When really the whole cycle begins with allowing God to forgive us and us forgiving others. And when that forgiveness flows, there's a whole cycle of cleansing and being made free. Matthew 10, 8, Jesus tells us, Freely you have received, freely give. We've received God's forgiveness unconditionally, freely. Freely we've received, freely give. If you want an antidote for anger, we have to apply the principle of forgiveness. It will lift our mood to a place of compassion. It will lift our mood to a place of healing. And it will deal with the underlying anger that we can feel within ourselves. The third thing is to go from unrest to peace. From unrest to peace. Anyone ever get nervous? Anybody ever get worried? Get worried about your job, get worried about your finances, get worried about your health. Fear is a scary thing. And when fear comes into our life, and fear is also a spirit. The Bible tells us God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power of love and of a sound mind. But when fear comes, it's an anxiety It can bring us down, Cass. It can bring us down into that place of heaviness. Fear can work with that heaviness, that unrest. But anxiety, just like heaviness goes away with praise, anxiety goes away with prayer. You hear what I'm saying? Why is it that Christians, we turn to everything else to try and fix our anxieties, but the one thing that will help us, which is prayer. We try to talk to people. We try to talk to other ones. We try to fix our situations. We try to do so many things To try and get out of our fears. We try to control the situation. Anybody ever do that? We don't have any control freaks in here, do we? I know, you're just not raising your hand. See, I was honest. Hands up. When fear comes in, we have to lay it down at the feet of Jesus. We have to pray. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. It says, do not be anxious. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication... With thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. You see, when the fear and the anxiety comes out, and these are some, some, these are some simple truths. A lot of us have heard these truths for years. But just because we know them doesn't mean we do that. You get what I'm saying? Just because we know them doesn't mean we do that. If you have unrest, if you have anxiety, you need to get down on your knees and begin to pray. We need to get down and say, God, I can't control the circumstance. I can't do, I am so worried about this. I'm so afraid about the circumstance. I have so much unrest. But God, I need your peace. Because you know what happens as we begin to pray? God reminds us of when he's answered the prayers before. He reminds us of things in his word that tell us promises in his word about those situations. You see, what happens is fear comes when we don't trust God to really take care of the situation. And we're human, and sometimes we get that way. The only way we can correct that lack of trust is by spending time with God. You know, if you feel anxiety about a relationship with another person, going and spending time with that person can do one of two things. It can either make it worse because you see how bad it is, or it can reassure you that all things are okay. Well, the ultimate person that everything has to be okay with is Jesus. So when we spend time with him, he reassures us, hey, it's all right. It's all right. We're told in Peter, kind of goes along with our scripture from James, 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7. It says, therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. And verse 7 is awesome. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. When we pray, we cast our burdens on Him. He gives us rest in our spirit, man. He brings a peace. He brings a calm assurance that He's in control of the circumstance of the situation that He will handle. And no matter what we might be going through, if we would release control, He'll accomplish His plans. So let's summarize for a minute. If your mood is depression, what are you supposed to do? 
Okay, let's let's get this right. If your mood is depression, is heaviness, what are you supposed to do? Praise. Say it a little louder. If your mood is depression, what are you supposed to do? Praise. 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 If your mood is anger, what are you supposed to do? Forgive. Yeah. Mm, there was hesitation there. If your mood is anger, what are you supposed to do? Forgive. Forgive. And if your mood is unrest, if your mood is fear or anxiety, what do you do? Pray. Pray. Simple things. Yet, man, the enemy works really hard to keep us from doing those things. And, man, I, I know sometimes I've had situations in my life where I've been so riled up. And what I have to do is I have to force myself to get on my knees, quiet myself, begin praising the Lord. I like to pray in the Spirit. Because there's something that then it's not me what I want to happen, it's what God wants to happen. And begin to pray and seek God. And you know, it doesn't take long before peace begins to flood over my heart, before joy begins to come back in and rest. And if I need to forgive someone, nothing helps anger more than forgiveness. But sometimes you see what happens in this life is we do just the opposite. We want to lift ourselves out of our own moods. So people try to lift themselves out of heaviness by drinking or drugging or, or sexual encounters or other things. You know, drinking and drugging, all that's going to really do is make you more depressed. Alcohol is a depressant. I don't know why people turn to it to unwind and to, and to, and to uh, feel better about themselves. Because it's an actual depressant. If you're depressed, alcohol will depress you further. Drugs aren't going to help you. It might give you a high, but you've got to come down at some point. When we're angry, people want to, sometimes they want to try and get everybody else mad at the same person. You be mad. You carry my burden. You be mad with me and carry my anger. And all they do is rile everybody else up. Instead of letting forgiveness flow so the body of Christ can be one, so our families can have unity. And fear, man, we try to control it and fix our situation when we just need to turn it over to God, cast your cares on Him, let Him have control. When we do that, can we put that first slide, let their mood... When we do that, our mood can change. We can go from down and discouraged to happy face. Hopefully it doesn't look like that. <laughs> but God will lift our mood from that place. God wants to lift our mood so that you might be...